Welcome back to Not Your Average Joe, the podcast that'll make anyone a little less average. I'm your host, Joe Franco, and today's episode is going to be a major mind banger. That's a word that I made up a few years ago where it's like, I can't even understand what I'm about to tell you. This is a part of my book review series. It is the most fascinating book about neuroscience, storytelling, and human wiring of just how we exist and why story is at the root of all of it. I read this book in a few days and I couldn't stop reading it. And I, I highlighted it, I took notes. If you're watching the visual, I'll show some of the pages uh, of how deeply invested in this book I was. But similar to my last book review, The Psychology of Money, I'm breaking down 21 lessons that I learned from this book and I'm really excited because whether you read it or not, they're the gems that you will not be expecting but will actually change your life. It definitely changed mine. Kill the intro, sis. You know she's not your average show, not your average show. The brain processes about 11 million bits of information at any given moment, but they're only making us aware of no more than 40. It's efficiency at its finest, and the reason why is for our survival. Our brain, whether you like to think of it or not, has been evolved over hundreds and thousands of years to be as efficient as possible, to focus on what's important. And a lot of times our stone age neural pathways backfire. But this book makes you aware of them so you can not only be aware of what's happening in your own mind, but tell better stories and overall like just connect better with people knowing the neuroscience behind how the brain works. It's fascinating. Y'all buckle up. The author of this book his name is will store and i'm trying to like stalk this man wherever he is and take his seminars and classes the main difference between us and any other animal is that we have this ability to reason we have the ability to believe in myths if you've read sapiens another highly recommended book you understand why and it's basically because of evolution being able to believe in common thoughts we were able to unite in larger groups even though we as humans are not the strongest creatures on the planet we have this superpower which is the ability to believe in non -existent existent things and it's because of our brains wiring to tell stories to explain everything and why do we do this because stories make us feel safe our brains build theories and explanations about what's happening around us it's our way of trying to control because they assign meaning they connect pieces of random information and our puny brains can then feel like everything is fine and we evolved from hunter-gatherer brains which meant that we not only needed to connect the dots of the world around us, the environments around us, but we needed to connect to each other for survival's sake. And the string that held everything together for us to collaborate were myths. And those myths and stories and gossip became the guidebook to surviving in our society. And even though we're not hunters and gatherers anymore, our brains have not evolved out of that. So knowing this is already powerful. Obviously this book is written for writers, but I believe storytelling is the fabric of everything that we do. So if you're a writer, this will help you. If you're not a writer and you're a human being, this will also help you. It's just dope. It's a blur between psychology, neuroscience, stories, uh, anthropology, sociology. Like if I could study this for the rest of my life, I would. So I will. Storytelling is as much of a craft to hone as it is natural. We are all born to tell stories. I always said that reading a good book was like curling up in the corner of someone else's brain and that writing is the closest thing to becoming immortal because that individual's consciousness is on a page for others to enjoy for centuries after they're gone. And I have author friends that when I read their books, it's like I'm playing in their mental playground with them. Or as the book puts it, Will Store says, story is a portal, a hallucination with and a hallucination, the closest we'll ever really come to escape. Y'all, this shit so much we do. What the author argues is that our lives are essentially meaningless unless we tell stories. And guess what? It's not a choice. You tell stories every day, you listen to stories every day, your life is built on pillars of stories that you were told since you were born and that you're told currently. Did you ever think about that? Let's get into these mind banger takeaways. Takeaway number one, our brains are wired to look for missing pieces. 
We thrive on incomplete data sets. Studies were done by psychologist George Lowenstein, where participants were shown three photographs, parts of someone's body like random hands, feet, torso. A second group was only shown two parts, and a third group was only shown the picture of a person. The mystery grew as people saw fragmented pieces of bodies. They didn't know what the person looked like, and what that study showed us was that in order to appeal to a human brain, you need to create a lure, you need to create mystery, because our brains want to finish the puzzle. Imagine you have a puzzle and you're almost done with it and you're missing like five pieces. You will finish because your brain can't help but finish it. So a really interesting way to use how this software in our brain works is by starting stories with questions, posing a mystery. Takeaway number two, your life, Will says, is a story. And the world that we experience out there is actually just a reconstruction of that reality that's built inside of our own heads. And it's an act of the storytelling brain. Your brain predicts what things should be and then generates hallucinations based on those predictions. And that's how we see the world. And for accuracy's sake, we have our senses. How wild is that? Like no two people can really experience the same thing because no two brains will generate the exact same hallucinations at any given moment. Shocking. Takeaway number three, we blink for 10% of our waking lives. I blink for a lot more if you ever watch my videos. I'm always blinking. I don't know what that's about. But imagine how much of the information that's right in front of us that we miss in those gaps. Like 10% of our lives we are not even seeing because we're too busy blinking. And that's not the only thing that impairs our vision. Our brains actually block us from seeing a lot of the things that are right in front of us. Magicians take advantage of this. You know, optical illusions are really popular because it's the appeal of the brain's flaws. And knowing that we have a tendency to miss things is humbling because it makes you think before saying that you're 100% sure of something. How many times have you spent the entire day with people and never actually realized what they were wearing? Like you wouldn't be able to tell what color shirt that they were wearing. Or how many times were you asked to say something that you heard yesterday and you cannot come up with more than one quote. I'm always trying to be aware of these flaws and remember this because it makes me not so concrete with my, like I don't trust my own brain. Like I'm open to the fact that it could be wrong because as studies have shown, our brains are often wrong, but because of ego and because of righteousness, we want to be right. But no, like it's okay if you're wrong because it's your brain's hard wiring that will purposely make you blind to things that you will never be able to see simply because your brain decided that it's efficient this way. And what's crazy is that the way that we see the world is not only unique to us, but it's also unique to us as a species. Animals have senses and internal abilities that we couldn't ever imagine. They see in different colors. There's all of this radiation around us that we are not aware of. Just think about the fact that around your space right now, there's an invisible world that you and I will never be able to see because as a species, we just don't have the software to see it. Insane. Takeaway number four, reading is brilliant because through words, we can create models in other people's brains. Have you ever read a book where you felt like you really knew the characters, like they were your friends, they kept you up at night, you even had crushes on some of them, like, yeah, embarrassing for my teenage years, but it's true. And you connected so deeply to the plot, you forgot that you were living in your own life, you really thought you were at Hogwarts right? Like this is the power of strong storytelling because what storytellers do beautifully and what people do regularly without even realizing their storytelling, you generate information that allows the other person's brain to generate a hallucination and create a model without being there physically, without ever having been there. So really what this means is a master storyteller paints a picture of a world, but the brain does all the work. So two minds can interpret the same piece of literature or content in a different way because your brain will create a model based on how you see the world and have experienced it. And books are really interesting because when you're reading, your brain has to do a lot of the work. It's not like when you're watching a movie or a series where the visual characters, you see them and you, you get a flavor for them. When you're reading, your brain is really building models from scratch, but it's not from scratch. It's based on your own experiences and the past. So we could read the same exact book, but the characters will look and feel differently because of what I've experienced versus what you have. And that to me is super fascinating because it's like reading is dope, writing is dope and this is a superpower that I don't feel like we talk about enough as a species. You can create a world in someone else's mind simply by writing things down descriptively. You don't even remember when you're reading that you're alive sometimes because you're so in their life. It's fascinating and it makes you want to read more. Takeaway number five is a quote, a real work of art destroys in the consciousness of the receiver the separation between himself and the artist by Leo Tolstoy. What an amazing quote. He's a Russian author and I've 
I've read some of his work, it's amazing. But basically the concept here is when you are really pouring your heart out on the page, the receiver of that work will not feel separated from you. The reader of whatever work is so beautifully written is not thinking about themselves as separate. Like it's impossible to read a book and really get into it and be consciously aware of the fact that you're actually just reading someone else's brain's words. Like you're not, you don't think about that because you're lost in the work, because you're lost in the sauce and what a concept. Okay, this is where it starts getting super interesting. Takeaway number six, there is this theory called theory of mind, which basically states that our brains are capable of modeling other people's minds as well. And that is a skill that glues us to other people. And what's crazy is that I've been researching this because there are studies that show bilingual children have a higher sense of theory of mind than monolingual children. Because when you speak multiple languages, you will look at a situation in various filters to toggle between language and culture. So not only is theory of mind higher in people who speak multiple languages, but it's also what Will argues one of the most powerful things that you could do to tell a story because you can imagine how other people are feeling, which is basically empathy and what they're planning, what their goals are. Even when we're miles and miles away, we can still think of our friend and be like, ah, oh, they're probably feeling X, Y, and Z. They're probably thinking X, Y, and Z. What that means is that we can experience the world from other people's perspectives or at least how we interpret their perspectives to be. I always talk about how having really good friends is like getting a window into multiple lives. I live my life, but having been with my friends for 10 years or more, it's almost like I get to see what life is from another person's perspective. And that's so powerful. So theory of mind is like the secret sauce to storytelling because it's the key to building unique characters and thinking about how the readers might perceive not only the plot, the characters, but the whole book. And I dig this because I feel like when you have a heightened sense of theory of mind, you can connect with people more authentically because you're not the center of attention. Like you're not thinking about how you feel about everything. You're thinking about what they might be thinking. And when you get inside of someone's head, it's really powerful. It's also dangerous, y'all. Like most of the masterminds and the villains in the world, like they've mastered this. They can basically think, what is that person thinking? What is that person wanting? And then they manipulate them badly. And uh, so I'm not going to tell you to do it for the bad reasons, but if you do it for the good reasons, not only will you tell better stories, but you'll probably make better connections too. Takeaway number seven, a good storyteller relives their own lived experience and captures it with enough detail to really put the human in it. So instead of saying like, the sunny room was calm when Joe was journaling, I would say something like, she had scattered books on the coffee table with a stain from last night's wine glass. The duvet was messily draped on the couch next to her raggedy one line a day book. Like those details, when you're writing a story or telling a story, they put the human in the description that when someone reads it, they start building a picture, like you're giving them breadcrumbs so that they they understand the character you're talking about. It's not because you're saying like, Joe is frantic, Joe likes wine, Joe is messy. You, you're seeing it because of the descriptive language that I'm putting in that passage that you'll be like, oh shit, she's probably busy. Like, oh man, she might have a wine issue. Like these are, these are the things that make a story human. And that's what storytellers that are really good at building worlds in other people's minds do. They add details of humanness. Takeaway number eight, we see with our past. Everything that we've experienced becomes a neural model from our brain to pull information and piece things together to tell you a story about your now situation, which means that people repeat patterns in toxic relationships or feel slighted at work and all of these things keep repeating because our behaviors are influenced by our so-called beliefs and our beliefs are nothing more than a collection of our past experiences. So in order to change for the positive, we need to first be aware that our brains do this and then make a conscious effort to catch whatever our brains are automatically doing and ask ourselves, is there another possible truth in this moment that I might not be seeing? Similarly, we feel with our pasts, which means that whatever you resonate with is most likely because something in your past has assigned meaning to what you're connecting with in the present. I hope y'all are still tuned in because this, this is crazy. Takeaway number nine, in order to write and tell good stories, you need to speak the brain's language. Don't get me nerding out over here. Like, do I need to get a PhD in neuroscience? Maybe. The brain is wired for cause and effect. That is how our curiosity is powered. And we need to not only know this for storytelling, 
but because you should ask yourself what mysteries you're obsessed with. Like what is your cause and effect cycle? And then you backtrack to see what was the cause, how did it make you react, and so on and so forth. So when you're telling a story, it's important to think logically about how your brain processes information. And it usually goes like, this happened and because of that, this person reacted and because of that, this thing happened. And that's basically how every story was ever written. Like that's it. Of course, a good story is compelling with beautifully written words, but they connect bits of otherwise useless and unconnected information with because to make reason because our brains can't help but try to find the reasons. So whenever you're in doubt and you're asking yourself like, does this make sense? Does this piece of information matter? If you can't stick a because in between those two pieces of information, you gotta find a way to connect it because if you cannot connect A and B, people are gonna be disengaged and they're not gonna like love your storytelling. It's just not, it's gonna be like, okay, and why does this matter? Like, I don't like this. Takeaway number 10. We are all flawed because our cognition is flawed. When we believe something we truly believe is the truth, but getting back to the beginning, it's all an illusion. And when we think something is true, we tend to find evidence everywhere about this narrative. It's our brain's way of trying to keep us safe. It's how we're broken. And it's why Every interesting story talks about how the protagonist or the main character is coming to terms with the fact that they cannot control the world around them because we don't see our flaws. They're built into the hallucinations of the world that we live in. And what's even wilder is that we often gravitate towards people with similar hallucinations of the world, making us feel more confident and in turn locking us up in a vortex of a confirmation bias. And that's exactly why one of my missions is always to be around people who are so different from me or have cultures that are very different from mine because it tests what I consider to be true or it tests what I consider to be the quote unquote norm. Like being best friends with Muslim women who come from cultures so different than mine, that's been one of the best things for me and for them because you're basically challenging your model of the world. And think about how many models of existing there exist and, and we don't even have access to them. But one thing that's very dangerous is getting in the habit of only being friends with people like you because not only is it limiting to how you can really experience life, but it might get you in this trap of thinking that you're right when you're not. I mean, we can even question what's right and what's wrong here because everybody's definition of that is different. But I think the, the point is having a diverse set of opinions and experiences and people in your life enriches the way that you see any certain situation because you're able to be like, okay, this is how I see this. How would my best friend who comes from a different perspective see this and I think that's just powerful because it increases your empathy and theory of mind we're gonna take a quick break if you're still listening please follow the not your average joe pod instagram account and tell me what you thought about this episode because like to me this book is the most interesting book I've read in a long time and if you would like to write your own stories join joe club we're doing several workshops coming up in the fall about storytelling about writing books because these are things obviously I'm passionate about but joe club members will get discounts and hear about it first we can grow together as storytellers. I think that's such a way to become a, a more well-rounded person. And if you'd like to join my newsletter to get book recommendations and playlists and all of these other really cool things, click in the show notes because I've linked the newsletter sign up and it's free y'all. Are right, y'all still with me? I hope so. If you're not picking up this book, I'm linking it in the show notes. I don't know what you're doing with your life because even if you're not a writer, it's so powerful. Like these are the cornerstones of all marketing psychology, persuasion, just like getting along with people, understanding yourself better. We need to know how our brains work and why so that we can, instead of being victim to like these software flaws, we can harness what we do really well and master it. It'll take a lifetime to master it, but like, yeah, we could start now, you know what I'm saying? Takeaway number 11. We can never really understand a person until we consider life through their perspective and point of view. It's like you need to mentally and emotionally climb into their skin and live a day in their lives, which is why a well-told story is the medicine to hatred. Because when you listen or read a well-told story, your brain simulates the protagonist's existence. Like you feel their pain, you see their struggles, you cheer when they win. Strong storytelling is the muscle 
muscle that we need to be able to connect with somebody that we might never have crossed paths with. And even if you do have a friend, let's say you have a really good friend and they live a totally different life, you still don't know what's happening in their minds. And when you write down what's happening in your mind and someone can read it, that's when they really see you. That's when they feel what you're feeling. My co-host on the Netflix show, Luis, he, he was actually such a great person to encourage my writing because I was always writing in between takes. Uh, I carried my journal everywhere and he was he was like, Joe, what are you writing in that notebook? Like, what are you doing all the time writing? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I just write. Like, I've always written. And since we have nothing else to do before they, they you know, call us back on set, I'm gonna just write. And he insisted, he, like a little brother, he was like, I wanna read your work, I wanna read it, I wanna read it. And he didn't stop until, until I read my work. And his eyes opened super wide once I read one page of what I had written. He was like, <gasps> I had no idea that's who you were. And I'm like, what? He was like, yeah, we've known each other for almost a year and I had no idea you thought like that. And he was such a supporter. He was like, your writing is beautiful, but I really didn't understand who you were until I read your work. And this is when it hit me that I carry myself in a specific way. The things that we all do just to survive, we all have our masks. But then when you read my writing, that's really me. That is the mushy Joanna without a shell. You're seeing how I see the world. And there's nothing more effective in getting to know someone like seeing how they see the world. That takes storytelling to another level. It's like you're basically downloading all of the things in your mind, putting it on a flash drive and giving it to someone else and being like, hey, here's my lived experience or here's the hallucination my brain has created and this is how I see things, this is how I feel things, and this is my you know, record of hopes and dreams. You understand me now. Whereas if you'd never written it down, people could assume whatever they thought was going on in your head when it was totally different, which seemed to be the case with Luis because he had no idea that I looked at the world the way that I do until he read my writing. Takeaway number 12, we've talked about theory of control before, but as far as it relates to storytelling, a good story is usually the main character changing his own theory of control where it's like being tested. So let's say you think in order to be successful, you need to work 24 seven, but you also have this urge to have relationships and so those two things will be tested during the story of a workaholic who actually just wants to fall in love and settle down because they don't see how can they possibly have this settling down life when their theory of control tells them to be successful they need to work 24 7. In a good story you'll see the main character change and go through something that questions and challenges their own idea of what they needed to do to win at this game called life and that's inspiring and relatable and very human. Takeaway number 13, we're all just out here trying to control things, y'all, regardless of having different personality types. Psychologists measured personality across five different domains, from neuroticism to extroversion to openness to agreeableness to conscientiousness, and each of us exhibit one of these five categories, either on a high or low level, right? And, and so this is useful when you're building out characters or when you're even thinking about yourself, because we react differently based on the level of personality traits we exhibit, somebody who's open will react much different to getting dropped off in the middle of a city they've never been to than somebody with neuroticism. So the neurotic person will try to control everything by overthinking things, whereas the open person will likely try to control things by saying yes to random strangers. Like they're thinking, how can I take advantage of this opportunity. Whereas the neurotic person is like safety plan, get everything together. And it's really interesting to think of ourselves as main characters because you have to ask yourself like which one of these five categories would you fit into if you were a character in a book? And what does that mean about how you try to control things that are new to you, foreign concepts. Takeaway number 14, our personality shows itself in the smallest things we do. For me, I gotta admit y'all, I leave caps off of everything. I leave drawers open and I'll be so focused on work for like chunks at a time that things around me will be messy for a few days, but eventually I clean. And when I clean, I clean. Like I'm getting in the crevices, I'm doing the laundry five times, I'm like, folding things up. It's just very extreme. I text everybody that I know about once a month, but then I'll go into an introspective dark hole where I don't speak to anybody. I'll go on benders of posting constantly on social media, and then I'll take 10 days off with no explanation. And when you look at those small things that I do, that basically sums up my life as a whole. I'm intense. I do things quickly. I miss small details sometimes. I juggle tons of projects and relationships. And while I feel frantic, things do get done. And what's crazy is 
like I didn't grow up with a relationship with my dad. In my teens, I finally started going to Brazil and like seeing who he was as a person. And I'm not even exaggerating to you. Like I had not seen this man in 12 years. I didn't have much of a relationship with him, but observing him just do his thing in his house, I realized I inherited the frantic energy. Like I inherited leaving caps off of things or like cups out of the drawers. Like I completely am my father's daughter. And this was not based on nurture. This was a hundred percent nature. The same way that I am my mother's intense daughter. My mom is super intense. She does things very intensely. She'll work for 15 hours a day. That I also inherited. And then I did some digging on this and I found out for better or worse, human personality is 30 to 60% heritable according to twin adoption studies. How insane is that? So what that means is that they surveyed twins behavior and personality traits based on who they were raised by versus who they were born from. And they realized that a lot of the traits came from inheritance, AKA like you are just a carbon copy of your parents with your own lived experience, obviously, but the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And it's like, damn y'all, I gotta like check myself before I wreck myself, you know, love you mom and dad, but I'm not trying to have high blood pressure. Takeaway number 15, culture distorts and narrows our views of how we experience life because culture tells us a story. And throughout our lives, we squeeze ourselves into the character that that story tells us to be in order to fit into the tribe. It tells us what moral rules to follow, what we'll fight to defend. It tells us what foods to like. It tells us how to fit in. As children, our brain is working hard to observe the model of the culture that we live in and wire your thoughts to give you the highest success rate of controlling the environment in that context. Wild. Depending on who you are, that might look a little bit different, whether you're the agreeable one or the rebel or the neurotic one, your brain will absorb the story that your culture is telling you, assess that, and then mix it with your personality and you will then react based on that. But what, what that's saying is that your cultural lens limits, limits your truth because you're already operating in this set framework, which is a story of your culture, of your country, of your language, of your people. When, if we didn't have that, we would just kind of blend and blur and be more fluid, but we can't help be born in a country with a language, with a culture, with a story. And that's why I think travel is so fascinating because you, you kind of like test your culture, you test what is considered right and wrong, and you start shedding the shackles of culture by considering alternative lifestyles. And, and that's what I've done for the last 10 years, which is why I think I'm able to mold and shape wherever I need to because I've seen and lived and experienced so many cultures, but fundamentally I still am American and Brazilian and there's nothing I can do nor would I want to to shed the culture that I was born into but I do think it's helpful to understand and live other cultures because it just refreshes what you thought was true and questions a lot of things and gives you alternative roots that you might not even have known to exist before. Takeaway number 16, super interesting and y'all know I'm gonna geek out about this. Certain cultures are individualistic in the West for instance and that was born out of ancient Greece around 2,500 years ago because of the rocky and rugged terrain of coastal towns. So I don't know if you've ever been to a Greek island but a lot of them you think it's gonna be this like lush full of tillable soil no, a lot of them are like deserts, basically rocks, and then beautiful sea. But what that did to the ancient Greeks was that it made everybody have to be very self-sustainable. So back then, when the individualistic lifestyle came to be, it was because in order to survive in that terrain, you needed to be self-sufficient. And because of that, just because of the nature of how the, the soil and land was, the stories that came out of that time, or Greek mythology, were all about these heroes and how this one person who could save everybody else was the success version because... At the time, that's what you needed to do to survive. You needed to take care of all of your village, your family. In comes this individualistic narrative that is still very much alive in the West, even though when you think about it, like we don't need to think individualistic. And then it was completely the opposite in the East where land was very fertile. And in fact, in order to survive, they actually needed to cultivate these large grain and rice growing communities for everyone to win. So in order to control their world in the East, they needed to commit to the group, which is why the stories from the East are often talking about humility 
and about how one person sacrifices their individualistic goals for the sake of the community. And as Confucius said, the superior man is one who does not boast about himself. So think about how your culture, whether individualistic or collective, shaped your idea of who you needed to be to succeed. You could even think about it in a smaller context of your own country's culture. Is it family oriented? Is it entrepreneurial? These are the things that shape you. You don't have to believe everything, but odds are you might, like in their there's residue of that in how you've lived because your brain is observing the story and is figuring out how to help you survive in that context. And it's wild. Takeaway number 17, different story structures were born out of these different styles, like I said. So in Greece, the three-act structure was revolving around one main character's thoughts, like the hero's perception of the world, the hero's crises, the hero's struggle, and then the hero's resolution. And the three-act structure slash maybe five-act structure is very common in the West. Whereas in Eastern fiction, the stories told were usually talking about one event that happened and the stories were told from various people's perspectives and there was no happy ending. There was no, and they lived happily ever after, making Eastern story structure a little bit more like uh, realistic because in life it's never going to be as easy as hero's journey hero has a crisis hero solves the problem hero has a resolution like we don't have a resolution in our lives until we're dead and even then we'll never find out because we're dead and so an eastern story structure i like that more because it's real it's realistic and then the joy of the story is like you have to ask yourself why does it matter what does this mean it's not spoon fed to you the way that a three act or five act structure in the west is it's not commercial takeaway number 18 apparently our brain treats threats to our theories and ideas of control the same way that our body reacts to physical threats, <laughs> which means that we go into an anxious fight or flight stage when somebody's questioning our vision and our truth of the world. And that's why wars start, right? Because people are so threatened by their theory of control being tested and being wrong that they they will kill, they will stand up. To, to fight to say that their theory of control, the stories that their brains have created are the truth and they're willing to die to preserve that. Because if their theory of control is somehow proven false, then they lose control and they go insane. And and that's, that's us as a species. How wild is that? I want to believe that people are open-minded enough to consider other people's perspectives, but from what I've seen in the past of like conflicts and the way the world is going, I don't think people are there yet especially not as like a full-blown species. I do think having these conversations about how our brains work and be like, yo, y'all, you know, your theory of control is very unique to you based on your past and your culture. That doesn't mean that it's the only way to live because everybody with a brain has their own theory of control. So how do we all just get along and know that your view of the world is different from mine because your brain is different from mine? But no, we gotta start wars out here. Gotta start violence out here. Takeaway number 19. We are all fictional characters with our own biases, our stubborn thoughts, and our brains tell us things that aren't true to make us the hero in the story. And apparently, it's even positive for the health. When we think that we're morally correct, it makes us physically healthier, like our blood pressure is lower, which is nuts, because even serial killers think of themselves as morally justified for their behavior. Like, think about the darkest tragedies that have ever, ever happened in history. People who have led genocides think that they're morally correct, and somehow persuade others to think it's morally correct as well. And, and that's just because our brains will make us the hero in the story. Whatever that means in your culture and the context you're living in. Because in the East, you being the hero might mean you sacrificing your personal desires for the sake of the tribe. Whereas in the West, you being the hero is standing up and being individualistic and saying, I've saved all of you bitches. So that's something to think about like how is your brain telling you that you're the hero in a story and maybe even victimizing yourself just to, to make you feel safe and then if you do that I think it's a great way to stop doing that because then you're like but wait what if I'm not the hero in the story like what if what if I'm wrong here and that's just good manners take away number 20 memory is not to be trusted we choose the memories that we want to bring up to support current ideas that we have about our lives and the world now and sometimes we even make memories out of things that never even happened and we believe them to be true because it's supporting our thoughts i've seen documentaries about people 
retelling their experiences during traumatic events like 9-11 and people retell it with such truth but turns out those things that they're retelling never even happen and they can fact check that it never happened but the person retelling the story has no initiative there, there's no reason to lie but their brain has truly simulated a whole new memory because that's what brains do so memories are not to be trusted and i have a dear friend who's a memoirist danny shapiro her books are amazing you should definitely read them and she said that memoirs channel memory the way fiction writers trigger imagination and what I thought about that is that like sometimes your memory changes but it doesn't make it any less of a story how many times have you thought about something that happened in the past and you think it was one way and then like a month later you think about it again and you either remember a detail that may have not actually existed or you realize that when you first thought about it you thought about it wrong like our brains are not to be trusted is the whole point of this podcast and finally the last question i want to leave with you slash takeaway is a deep one we are all living with this dramatic question that's lurking in the back of our minds who are we And a good story dives into the journey of that discovery. That's why when something dramatic happens in a story, it makes the main character question their entire identity, their theory of control, and and that's the story that sticks because deep down, as readers, as humans, we're all wondering who we are and why we're here and what the hell it all means. And you know how we sleep at night knowing that we're all essentially living in these dark vaults and our individual brains filled with their own worries, desires, and hopes through stories. Thank you so much for listening to this super intense, super nerdy podcast episode. If you liked it, send me a note on Instagram. Shoot me a comment on on YouTube. If you'd like me to review another book, please, again, reach out to me, whether that's on the podcast Instagram, my personal Instagram. Like, y'all know how to get a hold of me, y'all. This is not, I am not, not easy to get a hold of. Like, you can talk to me if you want, and I'm there responding. The next book that I want to review is called 4,000 Weeks. So if you want to get ahead of it and read it, Uh, it's a really good one also swallowed it whole and this is just a reminder that reading is so profound when I was a kid I would read all the time I was always 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 with a book so much so that my mom would yell at me like put the book down (laughs) but now I started doing that again I think when I went to college I stopped reading because I was annoyed with what they were telling me to read and now I started reading again and I've come across such amazing authors such like thought-provoking concepts And the book that I reviewed was The Science of Storytelling by Will Storr that I'll link in the description of the show. This podcast was produced and edited by me. And that's it. I hope you have an above average week because you deserve it. And I'll see you soon. Hey, yo, come listen to my girl, man. What you doing? Shit.